Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, company on Power Talk. Thank you so much for being part of our program today. And uh, really, without further ado, it's an honor to bring in um, a couple of uh, younger cats who are like just burning. They seem to get the idea of uh, urgency in the music, uh, love in the music constant creation in the music and that's just from seeing him one time at neil casal's farewell concert and uh, uh it's just going to be great to hang with him jared and jonathan madsen welcome to the jake feinberg show thank you jake we're super stoked to be here man thanks for the kind words did you uh did you guys um growing up how early on did you get into the jam rooms together like just you and your brother you, you either one you can take it but how early were you kind of just making stuff up on your own? Oh, man, that was probably when we were in, like, high school because we both started on guitar, and um, this is me, Jonathan. I, I eventually shifted to the drums in high school, so that was when we, when we really started just, like, creating in our garage, as you, as you said. It was, like, it was like a weird vacuum-sealed version of, like, garage jazz. We had no idea what we were doing, so <laughs> that, was probably a good, that was probably a good thing. <laughs> I mean, did you, I mean, like, can you talk about, like, conceptually? I don't, I mean, I know you, I mean, you know, we're all, I was from the MTV generation and things like that, but um, did you guys have, like, some sort of unconscious adherence to just trying to create your own original sounds right off the bat? Or were you influenced by, were you, like, trying to, were you ever playing cover tunes and stuff like that? Very good question. The, the first time I ever heard Bill Evans, instead of learning a Bill Evans song, we just, like, wrote a song that we thought sounded like Bill Evans. That is the sickest. And Dude, you guys are, le that's legendary stuff. I, I, I dig <laughs> I mean, it, it, which, which, which tune? Which tune can you, uh, that you, you, and how do you go about or uh, doing something where you want the essence of that, of Evans, but at the same time, it's your truth? Thought process. So, just, I mean, it's kind of hard to answer, but, it might not even sound like Bill Evans, but like, for instance, I learned that he loved using a scale called Aeolian. So like, I, I'm like, what is that? So I looked that up and I figured out what Aeolian was and we wrote a song with that scale. So sometimes it's like, sometimes it's their, the technique behind it. Sometimes it's the, the rhythmic feel. Um, but yeah, we just, you know, that's the beauty of jazz. You take someone else's music and you can make it your own some way. You just got to let me know who's talking and, you know, I just want to be able to direct the questions to, I mean, Jared, do, do you, uh, yeah. can you riff on that? I mean, I, you know, from your point of view, it just, it's, it's, uh, I, I played this opening track of Donald Byrd, the little Rosty 1973. Are you hip to that, to that album? No, no, I was listening to that. I was like, Whoa, I dude, no, I mean, I'm, this, this, this is the most mind blowing. Uh, it's Wilton. It's so he had Ed green. He had uh, sorry, Barry White's rhythm section. Uh, wow. and, and that was Wilton Felder and Ed Green just it, it, they started the record button and they made something out of nothing and I, I just I guess what I'm trying to get at is like were you did you guys go to the academy or are you total street scholars oh this is Jonathan um, yeah. we we started off as Jerry said just like kind of jamming in our garage not having no clue what we're doing just listen we, we we started doing that actually after we heard john coltrane giant steps that was the first jazz record we ever listened to and at that point we already had been playing like a little bit of our own original like rock music that was kind of inspired by like uh like modest mouse or something like that right. we were listening to that in right school. and um when we first got introduced to, the, to jazz through giant steps that's when we just started creating in our garage just like we were trying to actually transcribe what Coltrane was doing we had no idea what we were doing but it was it was an amazing like exercise for us to be able to do that to just dive into that two questions and, um, two questions Paul, did you did you yeah, eventually yeah. did you eventually learn it because McLaughlin in in one of my interviews with him it took him a year to learn Love Supreme so nobody really I mean that did you eventually learn it or did you just make it your own oh we oh no yeah I'm talking about way back in high school um we, since then we've been to we like studied at universities. We had private instruction, and we learned a very formal, um, traditional way of knowledge of music. Um, but we, uh, yeah, it took us about a year and a half 
or a year or so to learn a love supreme. But as you said, this is Jared now. As you said, Jake, it's it's not like we learned it and trained it in the standardized way. We learned it so we could, in a sense, like like you said, take the essence of what they were trying to say vocabulary-wise, and like see if we could put that into our own words using the jumbling up the alphabet soup that they the gumbo created. the gumbo yeah no that's yeah. that to, to me that's like you guys are the essence of that man like you guys get that and it's it's like the the aura is so um i don't know man i was you know anytime you get to play with uh, dan horn and farmer dave and and uh mcdougall like that i know that that was a odd iteration but i loved i i guess i also wanted to so you, so you had a little bit of both, the formalized training and, and then just sort of being creatives on the side. Um, but, you know, um, when you started to play live, um, what were you most comfortable? I mean, Jonathan, when did you switch to the drums? Was that a, you just wanted to keep a did – the, did the guitar playing rhythm-wise uh, – did you have the same inner time feel when you moved to the drums? Was it an easy transition? Actually, the reason why I did switch to the drums is because it was the first thing that really felt natural for me, and mm. um, it was the first thing that made sense musically. Um, right. I played guitar and bass for like two years, and I just could not, could not get it, and I wasn't inspired to, to even dig deep. So the the moment I sat on a drum kit is when everything made sense, and we started making music like almost like the the same month I learned drums. So, so yeah. and this is Jared jumping in now. The, the unique thing about Jonathan as a drummer is that when he switched over to drums, we were already into jazz. So he had this really unique perspective because he went like basically from ground zero learning jazz drums. So most people would, like learn rock and then they learn blues and then they switch to jazz when they had the chops, but he just like kind of jumped right into jazz, which was pretty unique. Jonathan, can you learn that only on the bandstand? Oh, man, yeah, I think a lot of our, you know, we started playing when we were in, like, high school, and what we thought was, was jazz, but which was completely backwards, out of a vacuum. Um, <laughs> but it was good that we did that, no, because that's, sick, that's, that's playing, playing, playing live gives you so much incredible experience that you cannot learn at a university, you can't learn at a conservatory, you just learn by, by being on the stage, it's, like, it's an incredible education. So having exposure to that was super important and i remember the time that it was super strange that we were actually learning the right way how to do it right and we were like wow what are we gonna do? what are we gonna do at the shows now now that we're now that we know we're doing everything wrong <laughs> <laughs> we have all these shows booked and we're like it was a pretty interesting time we're, yeah so well i mean but, um, you know i want i want to you know we got two class of cats on the mats and two let's put this track of music in uh you guys are on and then we'll come back and dissect it
I appreciate you guys sitting through my my guttural screaming of that. That uh, that was Neil Casal's con uh, tribute concert with uh, Dan Horn and Adam McDougal and you guys. You sold me for right. you sold me for life on that man. Wow, incredible. Well, I we you know. I, I mean, like, I know it's hard I to like hear. It's hard to hear through the phone. It's hard to hear through the phone. It's just, you know what it is? Here's the bottom line. When, how did you guys, you guys can take it individually. The thing that I see uh, the, in music today, listen, we're a more visual society today, and we've learned to sit and stare at people's facility. And there's plenty of people that have great jobs. But th if they don't have any soul, if they can't generate the soul, then you wind up staring at the wall the whole time. So the question is, how did you guys learn to approach music with a sense of urgency when you know that like you have to play as if your life depended on it because that's all that's exuding from you guys? The way I learned that, my friend, and this is Jared speaking, was valuing the audience, valuing the people who paid money to be there. And I think it's a, kind of a Frank Zappa perspective. You want to give someone something they're never going to get ever again at that show right. they, you want to give them a unique, unique show every night like the, you want them to be able to come to a show in Tennessee where we're playing tonight in Nashville or sorry we played last night or a show we're playing in San Francisco in December and get two completely different experiences because you know and what we learned that from was really just really studying hard improvisation jazz improvisation and that gives you an ability to truly freely express yourself and but do, with the cats like I don't quite know McDougal's background, but he, like sometimes when you don't even have a heavy jazz background, you can still slay the improvisation, you know? No, so, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, he, he, let, me, let me tell you, he would be the first to tell you he, fall, he comes up short as a jazzer, so he's a faux jazzer. But in that set, you guys were driving that. Jonathan, I, right. um, curious about, like, was di like where you guys obviously are aware of dynamics too. I mean, a lot of mod music today, it's they crank it up to ten, it never changes. And I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I live in my own bubble, but you know, I'm going purely on heart, fire, love, and I'm like, you know, I I just I like Clay Finch told me last week, and he's like, I don't know where those two, two twin. You guys are twins, identical twins. Correct, correct. And how like um. Is there, I mean, because a lot of cats talk about telepathy on the bandstand when you've been playing for months at upholstered sewers and, you know, you're just, you know the music so well, maybe you're reading the same spiritual texts or, you know, whatever, you're just like living together, so you're just having telepathy, but being that you're, the DNA is just so there, do you guys find your, did you connect telepathically? Do you, how often does that happen? Uh, we riff on that. Oh, yeah, man. I, it all boils down to Jared and I being just connected since birth. Like, since we were in the womb, we've, we've been connected to each other, and we've done the same things in our life. We've had this, all the same interests. It's, it's kind of weird. Like, we like all the same things, and not all twins are like that. Um, when we started playing music, we had already understood each other's, you know, vocabulary and connected on a subconscious level outside of music and so when we played music it was just an extension of that i feel and when we play music together we know each other's vocabulary musical vocabulary just as we know our you know regular vocabulary so um and you were talking about dynamics earlier and how you drive the ship with dynamics i think that's a lot of that comes also from just Oh, just wanting to tell a creative story with your instrument and not having, and it, also the fire that we have. Comes yeah, also from dude, that's, I know, that's what, it, what I'm talking it. about, dude. That's what I'm talking Thanks, about. Thanks, man. We have, we have, it's a desire to, to create something that no one else has ever created, you know? So the fact that we found our, our sound, we don't feel satisfied. We always want to keep expanding that and developing that. And then I'll jump in here too, Jake. Uh, this is Jared. Yeah, man. So he's describing like this, this deep telepathic connection that we have, which is, which is unquestionable. And it's like, it, it goes deeper than music, you know, it goes, goes to like sharing dreams and like, yeah, I can't even, dreams. I mean, I'm telling you, man, it's, it is. And from the womb, you know, I mean, yeah. but, but it seems but, to be, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Riff, go ahead. But, but this is the interesting part, but the flip side of that, the, when you saw us with Adam McDougall and Dan Horn and farmer, we had never, ever shared a note 
ever with Dan or Adam. <laughs> I love this, um, dude. This is so, the greatest. This so, is exactly in the pocket, dude. <laughs> Way out. So, <laughs> right on, man. So that shows you the power of expressing yourself with your instrument and being confident with your own voice. Because then the voices get together, and we just have a little conversation. And we like, I want to listen to Dan, and Dan wants to listen to me. And then we, let's, hey, let's all listen to Adam now. Let's listen to what he has to say. So that's like the camaraderie, like a, a, an instant composition, as Ken would call it. They call it an instant composition. So it's like, it's just, man, you just got to be super sensitive, and you, you can't be selfish if you want the music to work. Like, what is the um, uh, configure? You have to excuse me, but like in this, in this, these road gigs you're on right now, what's the configuration of the group? Yeah, that's just a duo. It's just Jonathan and I. That, we're on tour. That is remarkable. So, yeah. so, 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 let's be real, though. I mean, is it impossible? So you can have a conversation with Horn and McDougal and, and and obviously Farmer. You know, that guy's just talking with talking to the cosmos but he like uh, right. you know and I mean, I mean the guy's just honestly a, a hero to me but um you know yeah are is it really hard to find the companies do you have a company that you play with i just i'm not like hip to the live mats and too like is does the telepathy does the lineage of you know this uh, life force supersede is it very hard to find a company to play with no we don't need the company because we use looping and we use you know i loop my own bass lines and play over them and we have samples that we use at times and yeah we we, we don't need anyone else but the times that we do have a company that's like dan and adam that's like a special treat that's like a special c collaboration but while we're on the road right now, we're touring with Marco Benevento right now, which has been amazing. But he does his own set, and then we do ours. So, dude, that th that's class. So, wait, uh, so and then, um, so I want to ask you how how do you incorporate the, um, you know, just hit me to it because like I'm very anti. I'm not anti-technology by any means, but I just like the human element in music. When I see people that have vocabulary that can stretch musical vocabulary, you know, I just don't believe that you can do that with machines. And so I just wonder, like, you know, um, you know, how do you how do you create a balance where you can increase musical vocabulary uh, using the looping system so that it's just a duo because I'm, I mean, you know, I'm just used to having an electric bass, you know, like quartet or quintet. Maybe it's just, I'm used to that stuff, but you guys can riff on any way you want. Yeah. Dude, a couple things. This is Jonathan. Dude, I think it's a very powerful statement to just have two twin brothers on stage jamming and having a musical dialogue. I Dig. First of all, I like that element. Talking about the loop station, the loop is something that we've been, I say we, because we've, been playing on it together jared is the one that controls it but, but we have been navigating that world for 17 years playing with the loop and um because we've been playing it that long it's it's no longer a machine to us it's an elastic it's an elastic musician just like just like a normal human would be so wait, like wait, wait. this is tempo. really profound this is you need to break this down further this is profound i really need to hear about this okay. how, how does it become yeah, molecular because we don't use a click track. It's not synthetic. We don't right. use a click track. Right. We use our own human body rhythm that's inside us. And it becomes something that's, that's malleable with, um, with, the, with the live rhythm that is, that is being, um, that it's writing as, we, as, we, as, we, uh, as Jared records it with the loop. So it's like an imperfect rhythm that's almost like, you know, a normal, the, the way a normal band would, would have a fluctuating rhythm, like, you listen to those Tony Williams records with Miles Davis, and like, if you start it in the beginning, in the live recording, right, and then you go to the end, the, temp the tempo is just completely different. Dude, the Butch, tr yeah, the Butch Trucks expanding. told me the same thing. Yeah, but dude, you're spot on. Yeah, you nailed it. The tempo yeah. was shifting from so, goal twenty. You go ahead. Exactly. No, no, I'm just saying. And so, like, people people ask us all the time, "How are you making those sounds?" Because it, to them, it doesn't sound like a loop. Because loops, when you hear them at, at live shows, they're very boring and just like repetitive and it's, you could just tell it's a loop our whole goal is to not make it sound like a loop and to use it as like another band member and because i've been playing 
drums to that for 17 years. I don't even use in ears. I just have a monitor feed of that sound, and I and I click with that and I jive with that in a way that I would just with a with a musician. Does that make sense? Well, I'm just yeah. I mean, I think I what I what I realized is I needed uh, qu- uh, what is it? Uh, four four Madsons would be good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but it's like it's like a the interconnectivity. Um, is brilliant. Um, you know, one of the guys who put me on my path back in 2011, and you know, he wrote me. I promoted a concert in South Central. Uh, here was a black jazz. Are you hip? Are you hip to the black jazz label? You are gonna get your mind blown in a second. We did quite a few collaborative nights with Mr. Calvin Key. Well, no, because he's the one. I did a Facebook Live interview with him in his bathrobe at his house, and he was taught, this yeah. is four years ago, he was talking about you guys. I'm like, wait a minute. And, th- and then it yeah, came around again. Like, and it was amazing. You know, it was, so anyway, the dude, how did you connect with Calvin? And what, I mean, you guys played what, Chica West, I think? I mean, it was pretty mind-blowing. Dude, yeah. Calvin? Okay, so... I got turned on to Calvin from a Facebook post of a friend of mine. And he said, Hey, this guy, this guy reminds me of you. And I'm like, I checked it out. And it's, it's always a weird thing to, to listen to someone. And you're like, Whoa, that sounds like me a little bit. It's kind of weird. <laughs> so I did feel that way. Like <laughs> I get, I get that sometimes with, with my, one of my heroes, uh, Jeff Parker. Uh, I think we just both think in very similar ways. But sure. Anyways, um, I listened to Calvin Keyes and I, was, and I bought the record immediately off the Black Jazz record reissue. And I think it was like 30 bucks. It was super cheap at the time. Now they're like way more expensive, even the reissues. But I got that record and I just listened to it straight for like a whole year and listened to it every week. Just loved it. Um, and then I saw my cousin. He's an amazing keyboard player as well. He's, he's a master as well, but my cousin on my dad's side, on our dad's side. And he's like, oh yeah, I just got back from this jam session um in oakland i'm like oh cool who leads the jam session he's like oh this guy named calvin keys like, whoa, 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 whoa. We want <laughs> the calvin keys oh, like April man beard. that is sick i'm like yeah Shit, i'm like abe, abe lincoln beard calvin oh, no the, there's only dude like, he is like, oakland's fine i mean yeah he's a, he's a staple that it's br- it's brilliant dude. it's brilliant synergy there so you went down there and and, and you were and I feel like now the story's coming back. I, I haven't gone back to listen to what he said, but um, he was like, it's coming back. He's like, this well, cat? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. We So what happened was I got his phone number and I called him up and we were playing a Fillmore show with Krungvin. So I invited him to the Fillmore and he sat in our VIP area, yada, yada, yada. And he had, he just had a Pacifico beer yeah. and he was just enjoying himself. And like, oh, yeah. he watched our whole set and we came back up and he's like, all he said was, yeah. This guy makes a lot of music. That's a lot of music for two people. Like he was just tripping on it and dude. the loops, of course. But boom, and then dude. He's like, yeah, we, yeah. Holy shit! You guys are not from this planet, dude. That's a beautiful spiritual. Uh, that's really deep, man. That's deep. It was beautiful, man. Yeah, and, man. And he he said, Jonathan, Jonathan is committing murder on the drums. That's what he said about Jonathan. <laughs> He called it tribal. He's like, this is some tribal, ancient drumming. So wait, I just um, want to. Well, this is really special. Um, are you? So you're saying you went, you guys went over to the jam session, and 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 tore it up. And then that was when he was like, dude, this is insane. No, sadly, sadly, we didn't do the jam session. I got his phone number from my cousin. Right. And we asked him if if we. I just cold called him, and he and he like answered the phone, and I told him who I was. And he was like interested, and I told him that we should play some music together. That we should do, we should play his whole album, Shawnee, in its entirety. And then he was into it, which I thought he wouldn't be, because a lot of jazz guys don't like repeating themselves, right? That's and true. So he's like, I'm down to do it. I said the young kids are gonna love this. They're gonna freak out on this record. I so, mean, and then we, that's when yeah. we invited him to our show at the Fillmore. So he saw us there. We had not played together yet. What What is it about from from a from a from a veter- from a seasoned musician's point of view, um, you know Gene Russell. I promoted a concert for him. This is like eight years ago with the Skipper Henry Franklin, all the guys that are on Shawnee, uh, 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 Bobby, P- you know, and and there's Calvin playing 
those tunes and I but all that label what is it musically about it that seems to make it um, when I was interviewing Reggie Workman I said I used the word Afrocentric he's like I don't even know where Afro is there's no such thing as Afrocentric it's African so I mean what is the African roots of the you listen to that album every day it swung yeah. hard it swung really hard all right, I, I have this compilation of the song Renaissance on it. I don't know if you know that tune. That's ridiculous tune. It, it just it's angular, but from a musician's point of view, what, what were they doing rhythmically? Wow, dude. Um, so what they were doing, in my opinion, maybe like no, no it is, this rhythm. is your I, opinion. This is your interview. It's whatever you say. Yeah, yeah, bro. It's, it's like what they were doing was defying the tradition of jazz not defying it but they're going i have my own story to tell i'm not going to play duke ellington's music anymore i'm going to play my own music so like they just they they learn the tradition but they once they learned what they needed to learn from it formal formal wise they were able to create their own voice their own pathway and you know which i love that's why i love the chicago jazz scene too like the aacm and stuff because they weren't hung up on tradition and like the preservation mentality they were they were creators you know they wanted to which is what the black jazz label did they were just well that's what the mats and two is that's the beautiful thing it's like been passed along you know and you guys are in this, right this this beautiful early stage of creation um we have a game on this program called name that voice i'm going to put this in for you i just want you to take a listen to it and we'll come back and break it down okay okay you know well in the rest of, okay let me back up a little bit sure um by 19, by the time I, I, I came, came out of the GLSD uh, period and I figured out what I had to do, uh, which was basically start yoga and meditating and just change my life around, and <clears throat> which I did. And so I started that about a year before I came to, the, to the New York. Um, and by the time I got to New York, New York is, New York is a very intense city. Um, uh, and so I kind of like doubled down on my, on my yoga. I started to go to see a lot of different, uh, spiritual masters, uh, you know, basically once you open the Pandora's box of, of, of trying to figure out who you are, self-knowledge, whatever you want to call it, enlightenment, it's very hard box to close. And I didn't, I didn't want to <clears throat> in the, in the end. Uh, after doing yoga, which I continued for many years, uh, the yoga of, of Master Vishnu Devananda, um, and I, I would go to the Sufis. The Sufis, for those who don't know, uh, is the more mystical side of Islam, and the very, very beautiful side of Islam. Unfortunately, we don't hear much about it. We only hear about the the bad side of, of Islam, but there are bad people everywhere. Right, that's right, religion. that's right. Um, <clears throat> and I used to run into Paul Motion there, who's a drummer with Bill Evans. Oh, my God. Who was also uh, a follower of, of uh, the Sufi way. The Sufi way is very much like yoga, or, uh, you know, one of the uh, bhakti yoga ways. In any event, <clears throat> um, after um, seeing a lot of these uh, uh, masters, well, not a lot, but quite a few, uh, I, I ended up uh, wanting to be a disciple of Sri Chen Moy. Uh, this would be probably now in late 1970. Um, and so and I needed a discipline. Um, and I've always believed discipline is really the road to freedom. And I still am convinced of that today. It's certainly true in music, but I actually believe it's true in life, too. Um, and so that was, I began quite a rigorous discipline uh, of meditation and uh, yogic practices. And at some point, uh, probably about a year after I became a disciple uh, of Sri Chin Moy, um, I mean, things were going very well. I'd already, uh, Mahavish and Walkers was running. I mean, we were enjoying just phenomenal success. Um, not, I mean, not just musically, but commercially, too. This was the biggest surprise of all. 
And one day, uh, my Guruji, he, he said, so, you know, uh, Mahavishnu, uh, you know, the, the disciples need to, need to eat a good meal and cheap, so why don't you open a restaurant? <laughs> and so so that, that's what I did, and, uh, oh, and it was in Queens. And, um, and, and that's why I learned to cook uh, Indian food, <laughs> you know, uh, not very well, but I got better. I, I, I cannot wait. Them. I appreciate you guys sitting through that. That was, um, oh. go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, that was my fourth radio interview with Mahavishnu John McLaughlin. And I, well, I want to I be clear because I know it was through the phone. Um, yeah. I, I, this is... The, the, the overarching um, theme that I want you to think about is uh, s- sacrifice in music because <clears throat> John was told by his guru that he needed to, he was living at an ashram. Mahavishnu was touring. They're touring out there, playing to crowds. They've already cut their first album. They're burning. And his guru yeah. said, you know, um, John, the disciples need to eat. Um, you know, uh, can, can you, uh, you know, he, he and Jerry Goodman would sit on the floor and play acoustic raga, but he, he, he cooked Indian food for the disciples. And I guess for both of you, I, I guess more of the overarching point is, um, like, how, how do you know that you are, um, I, I think the point was that Sri Chimnoy said, are you going to, the, the whole idea of, of doing the restaurant was to, you know. Does he understand the full realm of his spiritual path? And I and I and I wonder how you guys cultivate that in your own way, if at all. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you guys are definitely tapped into a. I mean, the best part about it is, I mean, you're fusing spirit yeah. with. You know, you can riff on that anyway. It just I I found it profound. The guys out there, he was, it was less commercial. It was really less about it, the greed factor. Was just at a different time, and I wonder how you. I mean, Neil, Neely told me, Neely Casal told me, you know, nobody making this kind of, any kind of music like this is, is, uh, is making a lot of money. So it, it strikes me as like there's a craft, I mean, there's, there's an honest, sincere intention to create original music no matter what. And I wonder how you cultivate the spiritual path of it. Yeah, that's a deep, that's a deep, deep one. I think, um, well, we, we both believe that what we're doing will last for eternity. So playing things that is a manifestation within yourself of what, what you want to give to people, as well as giving, some, giving people something worthwhile that will change their life and help them. So I think music has this power to, you know, music is, like Neil said, like, I mean, it's a fragile lifestyle, so it has the power to break someone down and, you know, cause them to take their own life sometimes because it's not working out, and that's what they want to do with their life, but it's not working. Um, but it also can be a healing thing for people, too. So we like to think of music as that healing force, you know. So, yeah, that's kind of kind of it well i guess now. i mean just just looking at you guys as as yogic musicians i just wonder so you're you're giving off that vibration to the audience but what do you do for self-preservation johnny 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 came to the united states he was you know he doesn't really consider lsd or marijuana you know drugs per se he's talking more like heroin and cocaine but in order to he was using that stuff and in order to get off of it he turned to transcendental meditation and that's fine i i mean i just feel like that's a how do you self-preserve? How do you, where's your, you know, because I mean, it's just the road can eat you alive sometimes. Right. I think the way we self-preserve, I think the way humans are wired, we, I think we need to be givers. And the more you can give in your daily life, whether it be opening the door for someone or smiling or, you know, helping someone load their groceries, whatever, just being a good, a good, a good citizen, a good world citizen. I think it, that is the that is the spiritual perspective, the ultimate spiritual perspective of being a giving, loving human. You know, um, that's that's definitely where I would stand on that. Um, and I think the fact that John McLaughlin 
made food for people is a testament to that as well. Like where he's like, oh, oh, I should be making food for my, for the disciples. Right. So right. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the giving. That's the giving. Yeah, that's giving, what it, it seems like. Sure. That that's that just in that one. So when did so how can you talk about playing with like when that thing with Calvin started? How, how, how was there some magical like out of body experience that took place? I mean, it must have been. What kind of what were the what were the shows like? It was amazing, man. It was the thing that was crazy is that like I hear him jamming on his own, yeah. and he's been playing for so long that I didn't really hear where he was going really with the music. Like he was, he would just play by himself and try to show me the tune, and then like I wasn't really getting much because it was just so over my head. And then I'm like. Hey Calvin, why don't we try this song? And then I started playing the thing, and it was the same song he was trying to show me. And then somehow <laughs> it had triggered it triggered in his memory wow. the the wow. exact precision that he had like 40 years ago. Oh my god! And he, and he this, just played this, everything almost verbatim. And I heard the magic from the record, and it was like it was magical, man. It was every, everything was just coming back. When he was trying to do it by himself, out of context, it was like he was trying to figure out, and we were all trying to figure out where where it was going. But once we all started playing together. It just all completely rekindled, re-sparked. Yeah, truly magical, and the, and people loved it, man. People were like, "Oh, I, I mean, it's that is a that's a circle filled with love, man." Sons of Champlin, all over the place. I mean, uh, Jonathan, how did you, you know, you have your own individual sound, so you know, back in the '60s, Pete LaRocca, Tony Williams, Mickey Roker. Max Roach, Art Blakey, everybody had their own individual sound. And in music, in mod music, in my mind, you know, we've moved towards a homogenization of sound. Obviously, with the drum machine and click tracks and perfection and, you know, tuning and that kind of stuff. But how did you um, cut through the mill? How did you cut through the milieu? And what's your advice to younger cats about searching for their individual sound because um you know anyway we can wrap there but i mean if you could riff on that like how did just talk to younger cats about about uh you know how they find their individual sound yeah man find your sound by my sound was found by informing informing my musical vocabulary the way i did that was sitting down in the practice room learning drum technique reading books um on how to improvise, how to comp, how to develop independence with your limbs, how to do polyrhythms. It was all a lot of book, book, book. But the way you don't sound like a robot is how is the is like how you apply that. How do you how do you um, pull from the knowledge that you that you've um, gained, and how do you how do you how do you do that live? You right. know. So it's all about it's all about how do you incorporate your knowledge to to the stage, or even if you don't do the stage, to the recording session or whatever, how you play. But knowing that it's going to take a really long time to, to develop that, like knowing that you you are not really going to have an identity for a long time until you've established that musical vocabulary. And then once you have that, you can do whatever you want with it. So once I developed that musical, like I'll listen to old, <laughs> it's funny because I'll listen to like some like weird, like old demo tapes of myself yeah. in the past, like if we're like go, going through old material, seeing what we want to do with it. And I'll be like, <laughs> whoa, I was like, I had some gnarly jazzy chops. Right, I, you, I, yeah, I love this stuff, man. This is. Sick. I'm like, I don't even know if I could do that anymore. That was crazy. <laughs> that was a crazy time in my life. But, but, uh, but you know what? What it's done for me now is is the vocabulary and it, and, dude, the the more, the more I've been playing, the more I think about being simple. And the simple has such a dynamic. It has such a dynamic. Ah, um, oh, man, what's the word? just a dynamic reaction from people and from myself. Like, I feel that the, the more experienced someone gets, the more simple they get. Like, listen to Miles Davis. Like, he right. would have so much space between his notes. And that became and the like, music. You know, that, that was the, you know, that, yeah. the, the, the thing I wanted to also point you in this direction. I've been listening to this. I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, Paul Desmond did a very straight album in 70. He took 10 years off, and then he made this album. And the rhythm section is Ron Carter and Connie Kay. And like I'm not a big Whoa. I'm not a big modern jazz quartet fan, but not that I, I'm just not hip to it. I just don't listen to it. But the thing yeah, is yeah, that yeah. like like uh, there's this tune. I'll, I'll send it to you guys. Uh, it's, I'm old fashioned, right? It's a classic standard tune. 
I don't ever hear him. He's playing on the top of the kit. That's all he's playing. On. That, that, that's really a whole other subject is like dancing on the symbols. Like, I feel like that's like a lot. Joe Sample talked about that. It's just, I mean, you know, guys, go to Soundcheck. Tell Karina Reich. Is Karina Reichman on this tour with you guys? Oh, yeah. Lovely soul. Lovely soul. You, she's, our, yo, listen, she's, you, our, she's our triplet. You tell her to play her, her butt off tonight and say hi to, say hi to Marco, too. I, uh, I'm, I'm, psyched, I'm psyched you guys are uh, you guys are getting in the groove, man. Calvin, um, it's... You guys are operating on a – we're in the intergalactic together, man. we got to support each other, all right? Beautiful, man. Hey, we're going to be out in Arizona next year. We'll, we'll fill you in more on the date. Love always, guys. Love you too, man. Know that we could talk for two more hours. I no, no, this was – uh, no, this was I, – I, it's been cosmic. Thanks for hanging out, dude. Have a ball. Thank you, Jake. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Have a good one. We'll play one for you tonight. Play one for Jake. Later. All right, bro. Right. Take care. Peace. Great hang. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. See you later.